Anyhow, so so this is the human, of course. This is the nice lady's face, full of normal, let's say, microbes, and and again a scanning microscope, and and this involves, entails a very highly sophisticated and advanced equipment. This is the Dead Sea of our science and a metagenomic unit, so the equipment you will see, but it requires advanced equipment to do this kind of studies. And these are the investigators, Dr. Schittenberg, Dr. Ashab, he's almost a doctor, uh, Michael Brandwein, he is involved with the clinical studies, he is involved with fish, acacia studies etc. And Amir is involved in, in more in nematodes um, and in uh, studies of sinkholes, all of which are very, very challenging. And just to give you one quick general idea, uh, Professor Sprecher mentioned extreme environments. Obviously, microbes that live in sinkholes, or at least in on the, the the border on the surface of acacia, are living in extreme environment. So it is common sense to understand that if they survive in this environment, they have special selected characteristics to be resistant to UV, to be resistant to high salinity. To be able to live in very low pH and very high temperature, that entails and makes sense 
that they develop mechanisms that are extremely powerful to resist UV, to resist salinity, and it does, doesn't take a big brain hell to understand that the application is immediate or is not far away. So that, in a, in a nutshell, is what we are trying to do. So lastly, uh, I personally have been also involved in the study of this plant in Hebrew, Mor and Levona. So this is the Giladensis, the, the famous balm of Gilead, Queen of Shiva, Solomon, Temple, whatever you like, big history. But we have developed a study of this plant which grows in Engedi and have shown and actually have reached the stage that it is going or is about to be commercialized as a, as a novel UV protection uh, characteristic in, of course, in, 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 in ointments and in, in other products. So I think that with a very, this very short introduction, I would just say this is a summary, if you like, slide. Because what we are trying to do is combine ecology. I, I did, you will hear about ecology, which I should emphasize obviously in this environment, biology, agrology, archaeology, to with vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the various elements that some of which I mentioned. Just the last word, cutaneous leishmaniasis, is a kind of a novel new development that, that in recent years has become a, a, an issue. I don't know, you know anything about Leishmaniasis, but this is a parasitic transmitted disease, very unpleasant and red, uh, uh, fortunately cutaneous is less bad. So, with this introduction, right, Ophir, all right, so the next speaker <coughs> is Ophir, where is Ophir? Dr. Okay. Ophir, Franz is, uh, is the, our ecologist, not a newcomer. All of the investigators that you hear are not, uh, have not been born here, but have found that the challenges of research here are indeed challenging and attractive. So, Problems and 
you can see here uh, part of the main problem we have. And if we look at the, well, I, I would say the initial state of the, of the lake, and you can see the bathymetric line here, the uh, equal depth line. You can see that the problem in our side of the sea is that we have a very shallow beach. So every time we lose a meter, in, uh, we lose vertical meter, we lose we can lose up to up to 100 meters horizontally. The Jordanians have a different problem. They just fall into the lake. On the southern part, we have another problem. It was very shallow. So but at a certain point in the 70s, when the water level uh, dropped too much, the two basins became separated, and this basin is now lived as uh, an industrial set of ponds for the salt industry, and it takes water from the northern basin. So we have actually a much worse problem, a worse problem in the northern basin because it doesn't lose water transpiration, but also the industry. In 1997, we had in 1977, this problem became more severe when the two parts of the basin became detached and now we lost half from the regulation of the normal basin. And this causes the same holes. The uh, major, most important problem we see here today, I, I think, the basic story is that because of older and earlier lakes we had here, there is a salt layer which is not very uniform under uh, the soil. And at times when the sea level is high, the lake level is high, you have saline water touching this salt layer. That makes the salt layer stable. It's like the state, well, that's an experiment everyone can do. You prepare your next cup of tea or something like that. Just put more sugar and more sugar and more sugar and more sugar. At a certain point, the sugar no longer dissolves in the water and you have a sugar deposit that is stable. Now, when you lose uh, the water, you get to a point where the salt lake meets fresh or brackish groundwater. So this is fresh water that can dissolve the salt layer, and we lose part of the salt layer. And well, you know, gravity knows how to work. And you get the sinkhole. And the main problem is that again, a person can sit on the beach and it looks quite stable, but just a few feet beneath them, there's a, a huge hole. Uh, we won't take you to see those sinkholes, but one of the finest uh, adventures a person can have is walk on the soil, tap with your foot, hear that it's hollow, and then hear the cracks. You don't want to be there. The problem is severe. In 1980, uh, the year I was born, actually, there were no sinkholes in the Dead Sea. Today, there are probably over 6,000 sinkholes. That makes us the highest uh, the place with the most sinkholes in the world. Uh, we have, it's hard to estimate it, but it's probable that at least one third of all sinkholes on Earth are in the Dead Sea. Region. And of course, it's not just an experience, uh, it's also a bit uh, bit of a problem. Uh, the guy in the tractor is fine. Don't worry about him. Um, oh, sorry. This place is an interesting uh, story. Uh, we have a lot of uh, public beaches. No, no, not only does the lake run from you every year, but sometimes you lose uh, the, the internet themselves. These pictures are from uh, public beach. They opened a visitor center there, and a few months later they had to close the beach because of the sinkholes. Actually, uh, the decision was made in the parking lot two weeks before the parking lot became a huge sinkhole by itself. It's a good thing we did that uh, in time. So what can you do to save the Dead Sea? Well, there are a lot of ideas of building all sorts of the canals, bringing water from the Mediterranean or from the Red Sea. And today, the most uh, talk about the pollution is taking water from the Red Sea. However, we have some problems with this. Uh, some experiments uh, done uh, by adding water to the uh, Red Sea water to the Dead Sea water show that we have some uh, 
various uh, negative effects I will not get into. The problem is that if you put less than 400 million cubic meters per year, you don't save the density. You need more than that. But if you put over and uh, more than that, you get uh, all those uh, hydrological, ecological threats uh, coming into this. And if you actually want to increase the sea level within 700 uh, million uh, cubic meters, uh, which means that in order to save the Dead Sea in the quantitative manner, you will probably do more for damage than you could <clears throat> But of course, the Dead Sea is only one part of the story. As an ecologist, some part I'm less interested in. I'm more interested in what happens around the Dead Sea. And around the Dead Sea, if you haven't noticed, this is an extreme desert. I really like to put this picture. It shows us exactly what happened here. When you have a stream, you can find vegetation. Almost all of this vegetation, by the way, doesn't survive from rainfall. It survives from floods. Rainfall in this area is irrelevant. So when you go to the slopes, basically nothing. There's not enough water to support even the simplest plants. But of course, there are places with, with plants, and wherever there are plants, there are those who are dependent on them, including cute animals and humans. And when there are plants, the plant uh, life here is quite interesting. We are on a crossroad of two <coughs> continents and several biogeographic regions. So if you go here, and all the pictures are from an area of something like one square kilometer, you can see this uh, nice rosewood from India, tropical plant. You can see uh, this uh, fern. Uh, common in Euro-Siberia and uh, also in Mediterranean and Mediterranean climate, but most of members, members of this uh, group are found in Siberia and Northern Europe. And the acacia trees are symbol come from Sudan. And add to that Mediterranean plants and uh, other desert plants. So we have a, a lot of ecology meeting up here and making this place quite unique offer some unique combination. And of course, in order to survive in a place like this, you need to have uh, several uh, adaptations to the local environment. I'm personally most interested in the uh, uh, inorganic uh, defense and uh, inorganic components in plants. And we have some nice uh, examples here. The hyperflex, the plant actually uh, accumulates table salt. Okay. It has, right, literally, you can burn the leaves and end up with pure salt you can put on your food. But please don't use too much salt, it's not healthy. <laughs> the tamarisk has gypsum in it. It literally takes calcium and sulfate from the soil and produces gypsum uh, it's crystals. If someone breaks a leg, traveling, all you need to do is cut up off a few trees, burn them, mo uh, moisturize the product, and you get a very uh, low quality cat, but you also kill the trees, so please don't do that. <laughs> and what is probably the most interesting example of one I did my PhD on, actually, are many grass species that accumulate uh, silicon inside their tissues. They basically have a microscopic glass in them, and this can be quite substantial. We know of this species of bamboos from uh, the Far East that can reach up to 40% silicon per weight. So that means that the plant is more inorganic than organic, actually. Talking about microbiome and the fact that we are more germs than people. <laughs> and we also have, uh, let's say, the things that humanity gives us rather than nature. This is uh, one of the most unfortunate cases we have in this region. Uh, an industrial spill of uh, phosphate-rich acidic water in an ephemeral stream. You can see this line here. This is actually the border between what was flooded and what was not flooded. This picture was taken a few days after this flood. Uh, in, in terms of the amount of water, you have a flood of this magnitude every 50 years, if not more. So can really rely on the next flood, washing everything, making everything much nicer. You can see 
how this thing can affect the environment. We have acid uh, coming in contact with alkaline uh, soil, and we get all these bubbles from basically the soil freezing. We have this foam, and here you can see, I hope you can see nicely the line uh, differentiating between what was flooded and what was not flooded. <coughs> and this thing here, unfortunately, is not asphalt. This is actually the stream bed after uh, the event. It got cemented. <coughs> and I guess this is the most, uh, this is the most iconic uh, example of the problem. And again, you can see this line. I was in the field last week. That is more than half a year after the event. You can still see this line quite, uh, quite prominently. And you can still smell. Another problem we have here is uh, one of the nicest places around, uh, Napa Loquet, a, a short stream with, a, a, with a, a fountain in it. It goes really next to the hotel area. Actually, the stream crosses the hotel area. A very nice place to take families. And this pond is usually filled with children. I took this picture at around uh, 6 a.m., so there are so many children there, obviously. And you can see all this rush and a very nice environment. And water salinity increased tenfold since 1995, probably or almost certainly because of industrial pollution. We've already lost five plant species and two moss species in this area. They're trying to cope with this problem. They're trying to basically take all the water out of the fountain out of the spring and bring uh, fresh water, and salinate this water. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the operation doesn't work with full capacity, so all we managed so far was to reduce salinity by 10%, which brings us two years back, only two years back. And think of the people who might not be able to visit a place like this in two years of what happens to it and where they might go to. And that's a, a, a serious problem. I think maybe that I'm going to talk to uh, architects as well. People need solutions. If they lose this place, they will go to another nature reserve, which means they are burdened on another nature reserve. And this is a question of actually how we distribute space and how we use space efficiently. So I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, most of you have encountered the, the concept of symbiosis uh, in the past, and uh, the classic uh, this, uh, the, uh, so the classic meaning of this uh, concept is that we have uh, 
small number of uh, organisms that interact with one another. Uh, some can benefit, uh, in some cases they benefit one another. In other cases, there's one that is uh, enjoying the presence of the other organism, but is not damaging it in any way. Or we can have a parasite that is damaging its host. And it's, uh, it's in, this, in such cases, it's usually very easy to say if we have symbiosis or not. So in the case of the uh, anglerfish, uh, there are some bacteria in its light organ that produce light. So there's obvious symbiosis there. Whereas the parrotfish swims around raising some algae and, we are, and there isn't any obvious symbiosis in this case. Uh, enters deep DNA sequencing, which is a relatively new a set of new techniques, several techniques, which have enabled the biologists to sequence and identify and sequence even the most uh, the most uh, low abundant uh, DNA fragments uh, in animals and in the environment. Basically, we can uh, take water samples from the environment, ground samples, and identify uh, very accurately uh, which organisms exist there and uh, also what they do because we have their genomes and we can uh, say what proteins they, they uh, produce and what uh, functions they, they uh, perform in the environment and this is extremely uh, important for biological sciences it's uh, re very revealing because uh, in the uh, in the not so uh, uh, far uh, past, if you wanted to study environmental microbiology, you would have to culture bacteria from the environment, and th these are examples from seawater. Uh, you would get uh, you would culture bacteria from your sample, and you would get a handful of colony shapes, and only a few uh, you would identify only a few species per sample. Whereas using these approaches, uh, we discover that there is a whole layer of biological activity and uh, biodiversity that biologists have been oblivious to, and uh, humanity in general been completely oblivious to, because just because we can we cannot uh, culture them in the lab. And in this example, samples were taken from the world oceans, from various uh, environments. And what they show here is so if these are various uh, bacterial groups. We can see we, what this study shows is that bacteria, most of them are everywhere. And whether or not we can see them, if we can sequence them or not, uh, depends on their abundance. And their abundance is determined by the environmental conditions, whether it's uh, maintained seeps or coastal sediments and not so much by the geographical location. So all the bacteria are everywhere, and certain the bacteria will dominate in certain places depending on the conditions in that environment. And this picture is, is very up in two, in this case, uh, for two reasons. For, uh, first of all, there's a, a whole layer of reality we are just now uh, discovering, uh, because just because we didn't have the method to do that before uh, 20, 30 years ago. And also, if we want to understand the distribution of biodiversity, we can think of it as a matrix that is determined or governed by a finite number of, uh, of factors, salinity, temperature, uh, humidity, and so forth, and not so much by geographical locations. They are not this, uh, this uh, the geographic locations, at least in the case of marine microbiology, uh, is not as strong a uh, modulator as other factors. So this complicates the way we perceive uh, symbiosis. There are lots of bacteria and other microorganisms almost everywhere with an almost infinite possibility for interactions of all sorts. And this includes uh, not only the environment, but also the human body, other animals, the, uh, all the plants around us. And so there is all, and also con almost continuous flow of uh, 
of uh, microorganisms uh, that surround the environment and all the other organisms in it. And thinking of it, we, we, we have to go back and ponder uh, regarding some hypotheses that are uh, very nice but, not, but haven't been uh, thoroughly studied or considered so far, like the, uh, like the Gaia hypothesis, which claims that biological homeostasis in the, uh, is something that should be considered at global level and not, not, not at the organism level, not only at the organism level, or a certain <coughs> habitat level. And new data shows that this might uh, be a good idea to think at this scale. Um, so, uh, what I've said so far uh, uh, deals with ocean life. How about, uh, how about the land? How about uh, terrestrial habitats? So, uh, there's lower connectivity in, on Earth on, on the continent itself than there is in the ocean because it's hard to imagine, it's easy to imagine how bacteria <coughs> may move around in the flow and go from one place to another. It's a bit more difficult to imagine this happening on Earth. So, and on the other hand, there's larger uh, variability of habitats compared to, to, uh, to terrestrial habitats. The marine environment is quite stable. The range of temperatures is uh, smaller. The range of salinity is smaller. And uh, obviously, humidity is a constant. So can the same bacteria exist and persist in, uh, in various places that have very different conditions? And this region, as I said, is very uh, varied. It is, I did say, but it, it is varied. Even though it's called just desert, there are very different niches and habitat only in the area around us. And so we have a, a range of vegetation. There are brackish water springs uh, with the vegetation that goes along with it, and the fish that goes along with it, and, and insects and so forth. There's the Dead Sea itself, uh, from which uh, this, uh, uh, the, the knowledge of uh, microbiology from the Dead Sea itself amounts to a handful of species of bacteria and, and archaea uh, using a culturing method. And there are the sinkholes as well. So uh, the, sinkhole, the Dead Sea sinkholes, uh, as uh, Ophir said, they are truly a devastating problem, and uh, both ecologically and for the people in the area, there's no no one is trying to say it's not. With uh, about 400 new sinkholes yearly that uh, open up in the region, and infrastructure collapsing, and uh, all the things that Ophir said. However, uh, they are very new and very and interesting in ecological terms, in ecological uh, research. And they are varied for various reasons. They have different sizes, they have different colors, Minerals, or maybe various uh, microorganisms that uh, that have different colors. Some of them are uh, very pristine and appear to be very uh, even sterile and nice and uh, clear. Other are very rich with nutrients and uh, not so not uh, not so uh, saline as others. And uh, there isn't a lot of study on the on biodiversity. Although there are, uh, they have some sinkholes that were checked, and uh, a range of microorganisms and organisms were found in there, including algae and crustaceans, and uh, diatoms, and all and several groups. Not so much. Uh, not so much. Uh, I mean, studies haven't looked at uh, the micro microbiology of sinkholes very much. This is what we're doing here. So we are using a, a met, um, an approach that's called the environmental uh, DNA metabarcoding. We collect samples of various sinkholes, water samples. We filter them in the lab, and 
all the content of the water remains on this filter that we have inside our the, the funnel. From this filter, we can then extra extract all the DNA that existed in this water sample. And we can sequence this DNA. We focus on a specific gene that's called sequencing sRNA, and it exists in all bacteria and, and all archaea and uh, basically in all the living organisms uh, in one way or another. And then after we se we've sequenced it, we can uh, identify all the microorganisms that existed in this sample uh, by comparing the sequences that we get to the, the de database of sequences that are identified. So we have samples from uh, from sinkholes, uh, from uh, 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 regimes that are very dry normally and only get flood water. Other sinkholes we sample from uh, uh, from uh, uh, constant streams that get uh, regular uh, water, fresh water. We have samples from the Dead Sea itself, which is almost hyper high line. We have samples from hot springs that are sulfur rich, and samples from uh, from uh, M. Feshka, Feshka, which is the most, most stable uh, water body other than the Dead Sea in the region, and it's very, it's very rich in general. And what we see, if we consider that each point here, each dot, is a description, is a summary of the entire microbiological population of a given sample, we can see that while they tend to cluster according to the place that they were taken from, it's not the entire story. We have well, we have sinkholes here, and sinkholes here that were taken from the same region, and we have Dead Sea samples, uh, a Dead Sea sample here and here, uh, which are not exactly identical. And we can see that salinity, the salinity of the sample, uh, if we consider that the Red point, the dark red points are the more sa uh, uh, salty samples. <coughs> the salinity uh, is an explanatory factor here. It can tell us uh, some of uh, it. Uh, it can, uh, it, it, can exp it explains some of the uh, community uh, of each sample. And this is a subset of the population of the samples, and uh, we also see that pH is an important factor, and the location by itself is not enough to tell us uh, to tell us which bacteria we are going to. <coughs> and to summarize, uh, if we go back to the question I asked uh, at the beginning, uh, do we have similar observations on land to the ones that we see on open in the sea? Where bacteria are actually ubiquitous and they and they prosper uh, wherever the conditions are right. And this is a sum, this summary answers this question because other, uh, out of uh, over a thousand groups of bacteria that we found in the sample, there are only 90, 19 families that make the difference between the samples. Most of the bacteria happen everywhere in different in every in uh, variable abundances. And only, only 19 of the groups vary uh, according to, according to uh, either geographic location or uh, uh, more often the conditions in the, in the site, the environmental conditions. And just to make the point, so the most abound abundant group is the group that uh, prosper on the most uh, desiccated state of the sinkholes, where the water are the most uh, salty, and the closest relative uh, that is available that can be identified in a, in a public uh, data bank, in that public data banks, are uh, bacteria that come from, uh, from a, a deglaciated soil, in this case uh, in China. So, and if you think about it, there's a lot of similar, similarity between uh, the glaciated soil and, and sinkholes in the sense that uh, this, uh, this one once was a, an environment where bacteria couldn't proliferate very much, and then something happened to restore moisture, and 
and allow the most uh, opportunistic bacteria to prosper. So this uh, apparently this supports similar mechanisms that we see in the ocean that they also uh, exist on land. And it compares us to think about uh, to think about the, the explanatory factors uh, that control the biodiversity in this location and the multiple possible interactions between the bacteria that we find in each region, in each sample, in each location, and between other organisms in this uh, region. And this is exactly what we're trying to do when we're uh, studying the bacteria in, uh, in agricultural field. We need to understand all the interactions there in order to understand how they work, how they may be used to deter parasites uh, on the crops, how to encourage the crops, and so forth. So just to say thank you to the people who are doing the work here. We have Kavit Shalom, who is a geologist, and she's applied to the sinkholes because, as you understand, it's very dangerous. And they move around. They're not necessarily going to be in the same place they were the last time. So we need all the help we can get. And we have uh, Ashok, who's also a microbiologist here, and Michael, who's, uh, who's we talked about. Rivka Bethana, who are the research assistants in the lab. And the And uh, next we have uh, Navid, who uh, will talk about pathology. Uh, Well, 
so the deposit then disappeared in the mid 20th century. Here you can see the example. In our days, uh, the dead cement and dead minerals are used for the cosmetic industries. <laughs> so the just uh, say also about the low humidity, the heat, barometric pressure, uh, the very unique radiation in this area, which I will talk about soon, uh, the minerals present in seawater, in springs, in land, uh, dead sea land, and also microorganisms uh, present in the sea. And all of these properties are very important for the <laughs> beneficial uh, uh, properties of the sea for skin health and skin care. So regarding the UV radiation, so <laughs> a very um, special characteristic of the Red Sea area is that the A range of the UV radiation, which is this range, is much higher compared to the B range, the UVP uh, radiation, because of the altitude of the place, <laughs> the low altitude of the place. And this has um, the connection to the low uh, occasions of skin cancer, of the retina and DNA damage while exposing to the sun uh, radiation here in this area. Now, this does not mean that you don't need to wear sunscreen when you go out here. <laughs> or you, uh, you don't need to give a, um, a, to take care of yourself and the skin, but this is a very uh, important feature of the place, which enables the therapy here for the skin manifestation. So that's the chemotherapy. What kind of treatments uh, are given in this area? Heliotherapy, as I said, is the exposure to, you, to the sun radiation. The neotherapy, oh, sorry. The neotherapy, the thalatotherapy, um, is bathing in the streams or in the sea water uh, with uh, uh, minerals, special minerals. Cell therapy <coughs> is the use for man for skin therapy. And of course, uh, that when a person comes here for a uh, climate therapy, the fact that it, uh, he or she are vacation and relaxation give a huge benefit for the uh, opportunity for the therapy. Okay. So what kind of inflammatory skin diseases are treated in the Red Sea? So psoriasis is the most known and most common condition treated here. Atopic dermatitis, vitiligo. These all three are inflammatory skin diseases, which I will soon talk about. Additional skin manifestations are ichthyosis, acne, uh, mucosis, and non-dermal diseases like arthritis, eye infection, chronic pain. <laughs> um, Dr. Marco Arali um, also uh, is also part of our research group. He's a <laughs> Uh, a doctor, he has a clinic at the Dead Sea Hotels, and he's the one that is uh, the supervisor uh, uh, for all of these treatments in this area. You should remember, of course, that in some diseases, skin diseases with exposure to sun is strictly prohibited. Okay, so psoriasis. Psoriasis, as I said, is an inflammatory skin disease, also immune disease. 
So the causes for the uh, staff appearance are uh, probably genetic defects, uh, genetic background infection, uh, along with sudden stress. Stress can be trauma, it can be something physiologic or um, emotional, uh, and probably environmental factors. As I said here, the density that is supervised by Dr. Marco Amari, it is usually last three to four weeks. And the, proto the protocols are adapted to each patient, uh, depending, of course, of his, his or she's <coughs> unique uh, feature. And the side effects are negligible. <coughs> so, how effective is it? You see that about 80% of patients achieve improvement of over 75% uh, of the flat appearance uh, after four weeks. The duration, the average duration of commission is 33 weeks. Um, and these are better results than what is achieved with the uh, narrow band UVB using clinics. And of course, with less. Uh, less bad effects, and if you say their comparison to current drug treatments that are available, available today. So this happened to here, this was the chemotherapy with the most, um, uh, I focused most about the heliotherapy that is the sun uh, treatment by exposure to sun. But what are the added value of the uh, added values of local neotherapy? So you can see that the uh, 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 groups of patients that were exposed to sea and sun bathing, to sea bathing and the sun uh, radiation, uh, gained the uh, best improvement of 83.4%. Uh, so indeed, the neotherapy improve the result of the by simple solar therapy. And, and we have also evidence that simultaneous use of the dead sea salt <coughs> improve significantly the results of exposure to UV. Yes, this is just an example of a paper. Other skin uh, inflammatory skin diseases that I mentioned was the topic of dermatitis. Um, that indeed was um, treated here. Uh, we have a nice study by Michael Brandt and Brandwine. Uh, the study patients coming for therapy at the Dead Sea with the topic of dermatitis and the microbiome uh, of the skin before and after treatment. I will not talk about it, but uh, indeed also for topic dermatitis there are uh, very impressive results for therapy as you can see. <laughs> Vital legal uh, is the loss of uh, pigmentation in the skin area. Also as a result of the inflammatory conditions in the skin. This is a very famous patient but just for uh, He's not with us anymore, and after his death, they uh, actually checked that he was indeed uh, uh, <laughs> suffering from his evil. Okay, so this was just a test about um, climatic therapy at the Dead Sea, and now we will talk about our skin research. So we have a brand new, beautiful labs. Here. This was also uh, with the support of the Eagle Foundation. Very big support. Um, so, what do we do here? What is our uh, goal? And we do basic and uh, applied research and development. Uh, we give research services for uh, cosmetic and pharma and companies that would like to use a non-animal model skin uh, for preclinical uh, studies before <laughs> they move on to the clinical phases. And also part of our work is uh, working with the community. 
are no place to isolate because the, the very isolated university in the center of the state, uh, which is very uh, significant uh, activity. Uh, so this is just a picture from our activities. Pictures. Let me try to. Each part, what is important, we are talking, we are talking about skin research, is that each part of this structure can be the subject of a very um, important study for skin research. And what are the models that we are working with? We work with uh, cell culture, genocides, and paroblasts, which are present in the dermis. We have this uh, cellocytes, melanocytes. We worked with the human skin explant that we mentioned earlier, and also with the uh, artificial skin. And what kind of uh, parameters can we check when we work with this model? So we can check uh, the cell viability and the proliferation and differentiation of cells. The metabolism, of course, expression of protein, the inflammatory processes, <laughs> as they uh, respond to environmental uh, aspects, so stress, oxidation, and antioxidants, permeability of the skin and, and the properties of the skin barrier. At the moment, I'm studying uh, the influences of the minerals of the Dead Sea on skin barrier and the uh, antibacterial, sorry, antibacterial and antiviral properties, and uh, many more aspects of the skin. And what are the projects that we are working on? So we do uh, develop here skin models for health for diseases. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration with pharma and cosmetic industries, as I said, uh, and I also mentioned uh, We also mentioned the Comicora uh, more on here. Uh, there are studies of, on uh, medicinal herbs, hair pollution, and skin. is uh, an important issue today. Uh, the skin microbiome, which we call it, and many, many other projects. So, with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Do you want to make a question? No. 
According, according to the plan, we can have rules, maybe. According to the plan, we're going to have a plan. You're in charge. All right. Have a break of 10 minutes. Afterwards, two uh, lectures. Very new, interesting findings that you'll be first in the world to hear about. And afterwards, if you have power, uh, another lecture about uh, him. Who came especially from Montreal. <laughs> so, um... Network, the code is 1 till 8, 1, 2, 3, till 8. If you need electricity, you have under each seat for uh, charging your phone. Maybe, maybe we can have maybe a few questions what? to, you know, like, because I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, it was very provocative. Uh, our lectures, and I think that um, there might be some some questions from uh, from the students. Yeah, thank you. Some questions. Here we go. So we 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 we, we use the microphone to. Uh... So do you have questions? Yes. <laughs> we we uh, want you to be active. My question is, uh, which is that how does uh, uh... it is not necessarily prominent. This has to do with. This can be in many stages of a, um, expression of proteins, for example, of regulation of uh, DNA and tra transcription to, to RNA. And this is not studied all the way um, regarding the pigmentation in vitiligo, but just for you to know that not every characteristic is prominent. It has to do with uh, different layers of disease. In other words, it's probably due to the UV radiation. So without going into the mechanisms that generate melanin or so, the bottom... I uh, also in modern history uh, has disappeared, and my understanding is that it was due to irrigation. And I'm curious how the kerosene has learned from it. It's yeah, going to disappear in the next 40 years for sure, even at the current rate of, of uh, deterioration. Yes. We have problems and do not get into We have our own problems. <laughs> the, the major point is that quite flat. Uh, the Dead Sea is more cone shaped. I mean, you look at, if you have so little surface area and it will be so deep for for some relation to, to penetrate it, that it will not lose as much water as it is today. And we can probably, there are estimates that we have something like 100 meters more to, to lose before we get pretty much stabilized. And in throughout history, this is not the lowest possible. See some fluctuations in the last 10,000 years, and there's a limit. Doesn't go beyond certain time, Don't stop it at this point, or at, at, not, not to wait another hundred years and, and to stop it. Obviously, bringing water to the Dead Sea would actually have incredible implications. On one hand, it seems simplistic that just the fact of bringing water would resolve the problem, but on the other side, obviously, it would create some kind of an ecological transformation problematic. I think it would be interesting actually to hear more about those details, like why. For somebody who's actually not to be so obvious, uh, actually is much, much more complex. And then I have a second question that you can also answer than the other. It's just a general question about the Dead Sea Research Center. Is that I think that you are dealing with very complex questions, right? And so I think that it is very much of a transdisciplinary, or it requires a transdisciplinary approach. And so I was wondering if you are actually communicating, or how do you communicate about your research in order to sort of like understand uh, you know, or develop a global view on the phenomena uh, in the Dead Sea. Let me answer the second question because it, it is a major and then Ophir will answer. Sure. I think this is the biggest challenge that we have here. Now, we have a communication, you would like it. It can be an international center, so this is the challenge. You can help us with that. So, we do. So, how much is Okay, so, first of all, the press. Okay. The first question goes 
through the soil, through streams, through lakes. There's a lot of chemistry involved around those paths. Now, if you bring water from another source, they don't have the same composition. And that may be a source of, of conflict. So many problems. As, again, I will not go into all the details. I'm, I'm not a hydrologist, so I don't know all the details. But we're thinking about talking about cultural blooms in the lake. We're talking about problems of having a gypsum floating in the lake. Now, think about tourism. What if, if something like this can do to tourism? I, and I think I want to look at the screen in, in blue. But, uh, this is only part of, of the problems we can see from this. And of course, it again depends on exactly what part of the temperature, the pH. It, it's a complete, it's not just adding water, basically. And now, as to the second question about interactions and integration, um, when I need to present my relation fully in what I do, I use terms from, I think, three or four different disciplines. I'm a geographer, I'm a geobiologist, I'm an ecologist, I'm a paleobiologist, and I'm probably forgetting something. Uh, and I share an office with a cell biologist, and we also have another partner in the office who deals with tourism. The microbiome group sits in the next room, and Amir and I were both very interested in evolution also. So there's a, lo a lot of room for interaction. There, there aren't so many of us around here, so you know, if I have a question about something I'm not sure of how to, how to, how to phrase a sentence in a paper, I ask Asha. He knows it. He's a scientist. He's a very good scientist. So why not? Okay, I, 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 I want to add one more thing that, that we forgot. I think that the challenge that we, we face, and, and, and I'm glad that you raise it, is to get, be challenged to say, wow, I want to do a, a project. So that is a kind of illustration of something that we think is realistic. But it takes a lot, a long, a long and persistent and, and, and uh, I would say, uh, optimistic outlook to, to make it happen. I'm getting uh, reserved on this mud. In its <laughs> latest, I've never seen that. Can we go see it in its natural state? Ah, okay. Well, first of all, yes, parts of the mud. mud the mud is not everywhere. It's by the races, yeah. You're a geologist. I mean, because just walking this meter is... <laughs> the Engedi water. Uh, the Engedi water. Well, don't drink them. Um, but if a, if a few drops get into your mouth, it's not much of a problem. Actually, um, after the water leaves the reserves, they are bottled and sold in supermarkets. Which is a part of the problem we have here because, again, water getting a few meters from the lake and not getting into the lake. And there was a question of whether you could catch the water after it goes through the reservation or before that, and then pretty much kill the entire reservation. So there's a lot of water in it getting. Uh, it's good water. It's quite fresh. It's, it needs some filtering, of course. And uh, it's a very nice place to be in. I, I think it's one of the only places in Israel where it, you, you can walk 100 meters and, so, and, and find 100 species. Yeah. But why was the other river? What's the difference with the river you mentioned specifically? That's the, polluted. The, the problem with the other one is uh, that the uh, geological layer that where the spring is in uh, actually drains some of the worst chemical industries in Israel. Okay. And nobody's going to tell me about the mud? <laughs> it's a secret. First of so, all, if, there is, if there is the mud, you know, I see that you are not happy with the lack of answers, sufficient answers. <laughs> so, the, my, my advice is if you go to the hotels, you'll get plenty of mud. Alright? So, if there are no any more questions? Yeah. So, the last question. Well, this is a very good question because of, of a different uh, different reason because of the salt 
the position which raises the water near the, the, the hotels. So there is a, a, a true danger of, of flooding of the, of the hotel sites. And actually there's going to be a big uh, involvement of the industries in digging out the salt from the salt uh, uh, um, deposition sites so as to prevent that danger. But at this time they are not in, you know, that's not an immediate danger. All right, so with this, do do request that we make a break. Thank you. Just before uh, I can, before uh, I call uh, Boaz Gross to 
in his uh, presentation about archaeology regarding relating to the questions you mentioned, you asked before about missions of this history. One of the serious missions is uh, simply to uh, um, mediate knowledge, research knowledge to decision makers. This is uh, um, the committee, the communal, uh, something, the financial treasure committee of the, of the Knesset, of the Parliament of Israel, that it is actually have to take a decision about the future of the Dead Sea, uh, the future of the Dead Sea industries, who will be and how will be uh, uh, dig uh, salt for the coming 30 years. And they have to take decisions, but they don't know. They simply don't know, but now they don't know because there is lack of uh, research. There is a flood of research. There are 14 mega researchers about how should we solve the Dead Sea, uh, starting with uh, the Red Dead uh, that you just talked yeah. about, uh, uh, with desalinating, taking water from the uh, Tel Aviv area in Ashdod and Ashkelon and bringing it to the Kinelet back by importing from Turkey. There are various of solutions, and every solution has it, its research. The, the World Bank made a very big research. The Geological uh, Institute in Israel made the uh, big research. So actually, one of our missions there, in this uh, 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 committee of uh, financial committee, the first was actually to give them the big numbers and the highlights of uh, the research. Uh, the most reliable one. Now, they, they were are you invited? Us. Were you invited? <coughs> we were invited uh, specifically <coughs> because of this uh, uh, problem of uh, research bias. You know, the, the World Bank wanted to promote the Jordanian desalination problem. They wanted to, to bring you know, good fresh water, desalinated water to Jordan. And so the, the, the research of the World Bank was very massive, very impressive. But it was one-sided a bit. Another solution uh, from uh, importing water or desalinated water. So there are various of, uh, alternatives, and we actually put on the table. And I believe that we assisted the decision making. Anyone wants to step in, we can take it afterwards. So, Great. So I call uh, Boaz Gross. I'm the field director of the renewed expeditions uh, to Masada. When I'm saying renewed, is because there were no archaeological, until 2017, there were no archaeological excavations in Masada, at least large scale, since the early 90s, when they were led by Eld Netzer, the late Eld Netzer was a very famous archaeologist in Israel. And those weren't even uh, planned excavations. They were excavations that were uh, being carried in advance of reconstruction and preservation work. The major excavations in Masada last took place in the 1960s by uh, Igel Yadim. And I will talk a bit about him. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Dudu invited us to speak. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Guy Stiebel, uh, the head of the expedition, couldn't be here because he's presenting our project in Cambridge right now. Uh, so yeah, we're very busy. But anyway, great picture of Masada. And I'll tell you a bit about when this picture was taken and in what project. The history of the surveying and research of Masada began uh, in the 19th century. Uh, travelers and uh, scholars knew about the existence of this site, of this mountain, through the scripts of a very famous historian, if you'd like to call him like that, Josephus Clavius. 
his texts, were, of course, were uh, translated and carried out and copied from the uh, Greek into Latin, and bad Greek into bad Latin, and continued to be copied all the way to the modern age. And Josephus is the one who um, preserved the memory of events that took place in Masada. So a European, like the Sosi and others, traveled the Judean desert in attempts to uh, identify the mountain, identify the site as part of what is called historical geography. Okay, basically taking a text in one hand, going traveling on the other hand, and saying, okay, this mountain looks the shape that's written in this text, it's located by this and this site, or this and this path, or this and this stream, so this must be it. Actually, the first one to identify Masada never reached Masada, and that's Edward Robinson, who is a very famous historical geogra geographer, identified places in Jerusalem, Tel Dan, many places in the country, and he actually never s stepped foot on Masada, but he identified it from afar, from En Gedi. Now, you know the distance between here and En Gedi is about 17 kilometers. Just imagine how clean the air must have been in order to identify the silhouette of the mountain, rec recollect or remember the description of Josephus about the three-tiered palace, and say, this must be it. Okay? Of course, he needed to sail from Engedi to uh, Masada at the time, because the water level uh, was high, and there was the road that we drive on today was underwater. So, as you can see, both Condor, Condor was a part of the PEF, the Palestine Exploration Fund, it's a royal uh, British organization that took to itself to survey, map, and excavate places in the Holy Land. We can go into a lot of depth about why they did it as part of both religious and political and parts of espionage. It's a really fascinating historical period. But Condor and uh, others came to the mountain after Robinson already identified it and surveyed it and created our first maps of the site. And we will go to them later. Israel was founded in 1948. Of course, Josephus' texts were, text were known to Jewish and later Israeli scholars as well. And uh, Masada became a site for pilgrimage. Actually, well, let's call it, at that time, now it's a bit different, a, ta a type of national secular pilgrimage. The newly founded Jewish state needed places of heroism, places of Jewish heroism from antiquity as part of recreating our national ethos uh, as a way. So youth movements and paramilitary organizations, even before the country, the, the state was founded, found themselves hiking in actually quite a dangerous uh, hike uh, all the way to Masada, spending the night on the mountain, leaving their traces on the mountain, traces that we still find today, like different, uh, uh, different uh, remnants of garbage and little digs that they, they dug there to, like, like um, how do you call it when soldiers dig uh, to a place to sleep in at night? I don't know. Uh, like uh, like uh, foxholes, exactly. So they dug themselves foxholes to, to sleep in. Of course, damaging <laughs> quite a bit of antiquity in the process, but we can blame them. Uh, so the Jewish and later Israeli public was fascinated from Masada from the start. And the first Israeli expedition to Masada they did small-scale exca excavation, but it was the first scientific, academic, Israeli expedition, was led by Shmaya Gutman in the uh, 1950s, and you see the dates on the screen. He did some probing, and he basically created the first accurate, scaled plans of the site. As I said, the next one to really fully research the site was basically General Igael Yadin. This is the guy up. I didn't need to do that at all. I thought it's a laser pointer. It is not. This is a, this guy, okay? This is Igael Yadin. Now, Igael Yadin is a fascinating story since he was the second 
chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces. He was a professor of archaeology in the Hebrew University, one of the first, one of the founding fathers of Israeli archaeology. And these two titles, being basically the most prominent archaeologist and the chief of staff of the IDF, led to the creation of the most challenging excavation that was ever carried out in Israel, ever, to this day. Why was it so challenging? First of all, Masada, as you know, is isolated. I think you're all here because this is life under extreme conditions. Masada is an isolated site. And in the 1960s, still no proper roads led to Masada, which means a lot of the activity here had to be done on foot or with jeeps of the time, of course, with 4x4s. Four four. And uh, there was really only one organization in the country that could facilitate logistically an excavation here, at least a full, like a large-scale excavation, and that is the military. So Yadin had a few connections in the military, and the military is the one who built the camp for volunteers. It is also the first excavation in Israel that used volunteers from abroad. People actually paid to come and work in Masada for the first time. Now it's common practice. At the time, it was completely new. People who did archaeology was either were either archaeology students, soldiers, uh, youth movements, or people who were, who were looking for a job through the Ministry of Labor. People were just assigned to archaeology just as they're assigned to building roads or cleaning or, or whatever. So Masada is the first expedition that received uh, volunteers. The excavation of Yadin created the site as we know it today. It, have you been on the mountain already? So basically everything you see on the site, almost everything, was excavated by Yadin. Okay? Of course a lot of what you see today is uh, reconstructed. Reconstructed in a way that today no authority can allow, okay? With a lot of, let's say, um, artistic freedom, but um, there's, a, there, there's a value to it, there's a bonus to it. No one would do, would do it today because of some, um, let's call it scientific uh, accuracy or um, credibility, but it did create the most or the second most, I don't know, after Jerusalem or not, the city of David, but at least one of the most visited tourist sites in Israel, and I think in the Middle East, um, thanks to this. Now, to archaeology, after we talked about history of archaeology. In the site, we get representations of six main periods. Calcolithic, you can see the... Uh, you can see the the time of the Calcolithic period, we see activities in caves in and around the mountain. A late Hellenistic fortress that was built on top of the mountain. A Hasmonean fortress that was replaced, that replaced the uh, late Hellenistic one. We also know about this Hasmonean activity through historical texts left up to us by Josephus. And the period marked in uh, red are the ones that mostly Yadin found on the mountain and also that we have found in the past two years. And I won't uh, elaborate on them. Now, as I said, we know most about Masada through the text of Josephus Flavius. For those of you who don't know his story, Josephus was a Jewish prominent member of the community in the Galilee during the time of the Great Revolt. Actually, he was a senior officer. He was actually the commander of the Galilee during the revolt. And when the Jewish population in the north uh, surrendered to the Romans as their rebellion uh, um, collapsed, um, I wouldn't say he switched sides, but he was given an option. Either travel with the Roman military and record our deeds as a, a, um, a simple form of propaganda, okay? It's the Jewish commander 
now recording the successes and victories of the forces who are subduing a rebellion, which of course has a, a, a very strong message, or going to slavery like everyone else, uh, or die. So, uh, Josephus uh, chose to become the official historian of the Roman military here in uh, the land of Israel, and he recorded um, a lot of events, uh, among them the uh, events of the fall of Masada. Now, Masada fell um, four years after the fall of Jerusalem. Masada fell in uh, 74 CE, while Jerusalem, of course, and the temple fell at 70 CE, which means for four years a community lived on Masada when there was no longer an autonomous Jewish uh, sovereignty in the land. And it started collecting, besides the initial hardcore group of zealots, as you call them, of course, now there are a lot of uh, questions regarding whether they were actually zealots, uh, but this is how Josephus records them, okay? And you need to remember also on which side he was on at the time when he wrote it. Okay, so he had a, a, an agenda to portray them in a certain way to appease his lords, I assume. So now we don't exactly know, but to that hardcore group of rebels that occupied, defeated actually a Roman garrison that was on uh, Masada and occupied it, joined other communities from other fallen towns uh, that uh, sought refuge on the mountain. If we'll uh, go a bit back, the main hero of Masada actually lived a long time before the revolt, and that's Herod. Herod the Great, who built all the magnificent palaces, created the frescoes, the bathhouses, uh, the, the really in, in, in the, the scale of classical architecture and uh, archaeology in Israel, Herod uh, truly transformed the land. And when I say truly trans transformed the land, this is just a partial list of Herod's fortresses and palaces that he constructed around the country. I'll give you a small example. The Temple Mount Complex. Have you visited there already? So, the, the, the very big podium that now Haram Sharif sits on top before the, the Jewish temple, after that a Christian church, a Byzantine, a, a, a Byzantine church, and later the mosque after the Muslim conquest, that complex is the largest and greatest architectural creation, man-made creation, in the land of Israel until the British mandate. So think about this gap. Of 2,000 years, you turn on the light because I need to finish? No. Because I haven't even started. Because you're so good, <laughs> but the camera cannot see you. Your face is in the shade. So, yeah, I told myself, yeah, I need to cut it short, I need to turn to the review, but yeah, forget about it. <laughs> a anyway, you, you, you guys are doomed now. Um, so think about the scale of construction that for 2,000 years, no one ever built anything bigger than that, okay? Herod used designs uh, that we find mainly in the Roman world. He was a, I wouldn't say a protege, but he was a, his patron was uh, mainly uh, the Emperor Augustus, and he did everything in his power to please him, uh, calling sites uh, after him, after his family members, his wife, his children, his generally extended family. And we find elements of this architectural style also in excavations, because sometimes etched on walls, or sometimes uh, uh, preserved in mosaics or other uh, artistic elements, we find what we can assume are representations of blueprints. Now, of course, it's not an exact construction plan blueprints, but it's the, the sort of the artic artistic style that was used by Herod at the time, or Herod's architects. What did Herod do 
in the palaces that he built in Masada. First of all, there's a concept, the Latin concept, which is very basic for, for Roman, uh, let's call it nobility or upper classes, and that's the otium. The otium was leisure time. Now, I'd assume Herod had a lot of leisure time, okay? Because he was king. One of these aspects of leisure time was the symposium, the banquet, okay? And we find the halls that were used for this type of symposium in both palaces in Masada. Now, in Pompeii, for example, a city that is uh, contemporaneous to Masada, we find uh, texts in the uh, chambers for the symposium. We find texts either in mosaic or as part of uh, artistic decoration about the rules of the symposium. So, don't make eye contact with another man's wife. Don't be coarse in conversation. Don't get angry or use offensive language. And if you can't control yourself, go home. Okay? So it's a very uh, um, a, a strong cultural habit that uh, Herod is part of the extended Roman elite. He mostly represents the Roman world more, more so than the Mediterranean world that he used. And in excavations here in Masada and other sites, of course, we find the vessels for these, let's call them rituals. They're not religious rituals. They're cultural ri rituals. And we can find this sort of fancy tableware. It's called terra sigillata. They're very luxurious, very well-made vessels. Many, many types, drinking bowls, plates, uh, juglets, jugs, made from this um, very high quality material. And we find it here in the excavation. Another thing, thing that Yadin found, we haven't found yet, is a sauce. A sauce called garum. Garum is a type of a probably it stank terribly. Uh, it's a sauce made of fish. It's sort of a fermented fish with a lot of, of spices that was, I don't know, it was the most sought after uh, spice or, or uh, ingredient in the Roman world and it was made most, mostly in Spain or the, or, or the islands of, of the Mediterranean. And Yadin in his excavations found jars full with gaum. And they were actually full. And that leads us to other aspects of Masada, and that's the state of preservation at the site. Now, some of you here deal with climate and everything. For uh, archaeologists, Masada is, a, is, a, is heaven. Because the level of preservation here, because of the general dryness, even though it rained in the past, past few days, the general dryness here really helps the preservation of organic material. To the point that if you visited the site, I'm sure you saw you saw our excavation areas, right? And the squares, the excavation squares, were surrounded with these sandbags made from this natural fabric. I don't know its name in English. Sometimes these bags fray and they fall into the square. Now we use them everywhere in the country, and everywhere that we find a string from these sandbags, we say, ah, it's from the it fell from the sandbags. We don't think twice about it. We throw it away. But here, it actually led us to a problem, because we find these frayed strings of the sandbags, and then we think, wait, is it an archaeological find, or is that a part of the sandbag? It reached a point where we questioned ourselves so much that we decided either not to use sandbags at all, they support the sides of the square so they just don't collapse when we walk on them, or to use plastic sandbags, just so we know that, you know, Herod didn't use plastic, so w there's no mistake there. So, the site presents us with a lot of opportunities in terms of preservation. Another thing we find in the site is our ostraca. Ostraca are fragments of pottery that were written on in ink. Now, why on pieces of pottery? Because it's cheap. Pottery is basically like plastic or plastic bottles of the ancient world. It's everywhere, it's accessible, it's cheap. Things break, after they break, it's very difficult to reuse them, although at sometimes we see attempts to glue together ceramic vessels. And uh, so this material is everywhere. It's definitely cheaper than parchment or papyri or paper or anything else. 
So people use them to write receipts, simple notes, correspondence of uh, everyday manner. So here we see an ostracon with, it, it's, a, it's a receipt for a wine shipment from 19 uh, BC, for example. And this was found here on the mountain. But if we will uh, skip the greatness of, of Herod, and we'll focus about the individuals. And who are the individuals? When the site was occupied by Herod, we, we can't really see them because most of the site was, in, was composed of palaces and grand areas and the wall, of course, or in storage rooms, all to facilitate the palaces. But after Herod left, and then during the Jewish revolt, we see everyday people here, the rebels. And they left us other uh, uh, sort of remains. Which leads us to 2017 which is the first season of our renewed excavation. And it was our mission not to go back to digging the palaces, although we probably will because there are still remnants of the palaces that weren't excavated by Yadin, but to try and focus on things that Yadin either overlooked or just didn't get to, or didn't care about, or completely missed. And these things are these elements of the uh, archaeology of Masada, we're very, very thankful that Yadin didn't touch. And not because Yadin was a bad archaeologist, because he wasn't, he was a good archaeologist, but because simply in the 60s he didn't have the tools that we have today to excavate in very high resolution, very, let's call them flimsy uh, evidence of the ancient world. We excavated in several areas on the site. We, ex we were doing a probe in the Northern Palace, and you'll show what we, I'll show what we did there. The transit camp, or we can call it a, a, a small refugee camp that is tucked in the, between the western wall of the site and the Western Palace. A cave, or now two caves, in Building 13, and we'll talk about what that is, and a water sister. Here you can see our main uh, areas. Area B is the water system, area A is that refugee camp, and area D is that uh, uh, cave by building 13. If we'll start from area B, that cistern, um, how was it found? In the 1920s, the Royal Air Force uh, did a lot of, generally they, they used their Air Force a lot to document from the air in aerial pictures, and here you can see an aerial picture of the northern part of, of the mountain. Now, if we look closely, we can see this feature in the landscape, this dark area, which also we can see this oval feature right over here. But, ah, oh, by the way, there is a plane crash there in the 90s, <laughs> right, right there. And of course, the, we see it not only in the pictures of the Royal Air Force, but also in the surveying plans of past researchers. And you can see that they wrote here, sister. See, sister right here. And also in Condors, see, this is a, a Byzantine church, this is the Northern Palace, and a sister right here. But now, or now you'll, you'll be able to see it, but until 2017, if you walk the site, you see in the area that all the plans and the aerial pictures show sister, you see nothing. It's just a flat basin, if you'd like to call it. And we started excavating here. We took the uh, aerial pictures, and we put it on top of a, the, our surveyor's plan, which everything is GIS-based, and everything has its coordinates. We fit them together, and we opened our square where uh, we saw in the aerial pictures the location of this mysterious feature in the ground. And as we excavated, we indeed found that oval feature. Now, what is this oval feature? It is a water system created first by uh, uh, King Herod during the Herodian period, 
but then reused during the Byzantine period by the community of monks that settled on Masada, built a church, and lived between the 5th and 7th century CE. And how do we know this? We know this through the plaster. Plaster is, of course, a, a, a technological uh, uh, element, and the mechanism of its creation changed over time like many other things. So we can date with caution, of course, we can date plaster by its uh, matrix, by different ingredients that were put in it, by its color, sometimes. And we see that this system has two coats of plaster. The interior one is hydraulic plaster that we can see in many of the Herodian sites, or the water installations of the Herodian sites. And the outer plaster is this pinkish uh, type that's characteristic of the Byzantine period when they used crushed pottery shirts, they grind pottery shirts to uh, incorporate sort of as, as a grits inside of the plaster matrix and use them. So this is one way in which we can date the plaster. Of course, our research has only just begun and we will try other methods of dating this plaster, including carbon-14 dating on the micro charcoals that are in the uh, plaster. Now, this is where things get interesting. This is a very, very small probe we did in the Northern Palace. Have you, have you walked there already in your tour, in this balcony? So if you notice, now in the middle there's kind of like dirt that looks out of place. It's because we excavated and had to recover it because when people excavate here, they're like animals in a zoo because we put a fence and then around Two, three thousand people a day just stand around them and look at them dig in this two meter by one meter uh, trench in the ground. But why did we do it? We did it in order to find remains of a garden. Okay, this is the site of Herodium uh, by Jerusalem. And in Herodium, Dr. Daphna Langwood from Tel Aviv University managed to extract pollen of flowers. Uh, from the soil and from plaster and the plaster shows us what plants were in bloom either at the time if it's uh, wind carried the uh, uh, pollen or if it's locally pollenized a plant what plant actually grew at the site and in Herodium we found and actually many other uh, Herodian sites we found the, this constant um, connection between between the date palm and the um, cypress. cypress, thank you, and the cypress. Okay, and they always come together in Herodian sites when we find them in pollen. And we were looking for the same thing in here in Masada. This is, for example, in Caesarea, another Herodian site where this combination as well was found in the Sea Palace of Herod. We can also see this in uh, frescoes of <coughs> palaces. This is from Pompeii, for example. Now, date palm were, were also found. Date palm seeds were also found on Masada, and a seed from. Yadin's, that was found in Yadin's excavation that's more than 2,000 years old was able to sprout again in an experiment that was done uh, uh, nearby and this tree that you see here in the background is sprouted from a 2,000 year old seed we talked about the level of preservation of course and they nicknamed him Met Metushelach, Metushelach I don't know how you say it So, this is how we imagined it would look like. Unfortunately, we haven't found pollen of uh, cypress or date palm yet. What we have found is even slightly more interesting, and that's pollen of grapevine. And why is it more, even more interesting? Because while cypress is wind pollinated, and we can say, okay, so it arrived in the wind from somewhere else, Grapevines are locally pollinated, either by themselves or through insects. So in order for us to trace uh, um, grapevines' uh, uh, pollen in the site, they had to grow in the site. Now you traveled, you saw how arid 
the top of the mountain is, think about the level of irrigation and the investment needed to grow grapes on the mountain. Now we know, and it's not in this presenta presentation, but we know already through our probes and checks that in the southern part of the mountain there was an entire vineyard. Okay, we even managed to locate its boundaries and it surrounds a water pool that was used for irrigation. And the soil was brought there on purpose, which is a bit more fertile than the natural so soil of the site. Think about the level of effort and resources that had to be um, invested in growing a vineyard on top of Masana. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's actually a very good question. Herod uh, created, or Herod's architects, created an extremely sophisticated water collection mechanisms on the site, including aqueducts that uh, uh, circle the, the site and lead water into, into the rock, basically, into gigantic cisterns. Some of them are on top of the mountain, some of them are in the side, sides of the cliff. Basically, I, I can't say percentages yet because I don't want to just th throw data in the air. A lot of the annual rainfall was kept. Okay, now it isn't much, but it was enough because the rain here is usually quite violent in a very few rainy days in the year. So if you are smart enough to collect most of it, it's enough to sustain it. Okay, the problem is the invested investment you need to put in creating this channeling system and systems to actually keep it, otherwise it just flows off the mountain and you lose the water. So Herod's architects managed to secure that water and keep it for <coughs> winter times when it's needed. For, for summer times when it's needed. Actually also winter because the winter here doesn't see a lot of rainfall as well. If we'll go to building 13, building 13 takes us back from Herod to the time of the revolt. Now, it was a Herodian, either a barracks or a fancy uh, dwelling, but during the revolt we see a lot of expansions to that general plan of uh, building 13. We see rooms that were blocked and other rooms that created, it was expanded and other rooms were built all anew. Now, in building 13, we see another interesting phenomenon. Also, Eud Netzer in the 90s already figured that out, and Guy Stieber uh, is built on top of the theory that building 13 and adjacent areas, hold on, I want to see, and adjacent areas uh, were used by the community of Qumran. Have you heard of Qumran? Now, the people of Qumran uh, were a very, um, unique group of, even then, of the Jewish population in uh, Judea, and they're sort of a semi-monastic uh, uh, Jewish uh, group, and they also had the weird habit of writing on scrolls and putting the scrolls in jars in caves, which leads us to why we open an area next to Building 13, but how do we know it? Why do we think that Building 13, during the time of the revolt, used to house the Qumrani uh, community, by the way, Qumran fell in 68, which means they were able to live in Masada for a, a, a good few years. Um, we know it because of finds inside of the building. Yadin and later uh, probes in the site did not recover what now is it's already a questionable uh, a marker for gender, but they didn't find spindle walls and loom weights, tasks that are uh, traditionally attribu attributed to women. And women did the weaving, they did the loom and the, and the weaving in general. And in all of that complex, unlike other complexes where we know that were inhabited by the rebels, these uh, remains were not found. Another thing that uh, already uncovered by then is is this room that you see here. Now, this is a room that were, was um, translated, or 
I forgot the word, how to say it, interpreted as the, the Beit Midrash, as the meeting hall. Now, why is that important to us? Because it shares the exact same dimensions, but of course in Qumran it was much larger, but the same dimensions of the Beit Midrash, of this communion hall that was found in Qumran. So the exact same thing, in the exact same shape, only smaller, that was added to building 13 to the Herodian palace. I'll skip this because I'm speaking too long. The Qumran complex, which leads us to area D. This is building 13, and here you can see this cavity, okay? This depression in the ground. It's a cave that Yadin already identified, but didn't excavate. And Yadin didn't have this theory yet that Building 13 was occupied by the community of Qumran. So when Guy, Guy Stieber, came to the site, he says, okay, if we know that the Qumrani people sat here, and we know of this weird habit of writing scrolls and burying them in caves, here we have a cave right next to their meeting hall that is unexcavated. So of course, it triggered his curiosity, and we opened an area. Area D, that you see here. Now that the, this cave is completely excavated, including the chamber that you see here, which is carved and very nicely made. Unfortunately, I can't tell you that we found scrolls. We found, uh, right on the last day of this season, which was Friday. Actually, we started finding it on Wednesday, when we continued excavating right to the very end. After a lot of excitement and anticipation, because most of the layers were just silt that carried in there for, for, for centuries, which had nothing in it, like no datable material. So we could, it could go either way. Right at the bottom, we found a crushed layer of Byzantine pottery, which of course the Byzantine is a few hundred years later. So no scrolls, but we did find a, a few fragments of what's called a, a, a scroll jar. Now, scroll jars are, we know them from Qumran, we have a few uh, from Asada as well, are jars that were specifically made to store scrolls. And they're made from very specific material, very specific shape and technique, and we found a few fragments of them. So, although we didn't find the scrolls themselves, we cannot overrule that sometime in antiquity they did hold the scrolls, but of course, later activity um, destroyed them or looted them or did whatever, and we didn't get to find them. Another thing that we excavated, and this is an example. Another thing that we excavated uh, in Building 13 is this hole that you see in the ground, and it tells you a little bit of a lesson in uh, archaeological history. And why? Because this hole in the ground is located in one of the rooms that Yadin excavated and there's a photo of the room with a photo of the top of this hole in the ground. And Yadin excavated, yes, I excavated the room, I found this hole, I didn't excavate the hole. So I said, fine, you already, there's another underground cavity, another feature that is left for us to excavate it, left untouched with Yadin. The lesson we learned is that when Yadin tells you we didn't excavate this hole, it means we didn't excavate it only up to two meters, which he did excavate it. Where the guy sits, we still find modern garbage left by Yadin. But luckily, underneath this layer, there's no more modern garbage, and it's clean layers. So for future seasons, we definitely have some meat in there. So, you know, the sky's the limit. Anything can happen still. Area A is one of our main areas, and this is what I refer to as the refugee camp, okay? It's located here. This is the Western Palace, one of the most luxurious buildings you can find on the mountain or anywhere else in the Roman period in uh, Israel. And this is the casement wall. This is the, the fortification wall on the side. In between them, wedged between them, we found a series of very flimsy walls, uh, a few hearths, Taboons, you know, these ovens, and material dated to the rebellion. And we translated it, also Yadin already found it, but didn't excavate it because he had nicer things to dig. And there we found a series of floors that are dated to the, uh, to the Jewish revolt, to the Great Revolt. 
And as I said, the preservation of the site is so good that we can find entire, uh, um, entire vessels. Now, here you see a very famous uh, vessel. It's called Ubuntaria. And this is a perfume um, a juglet or, or a bottle, very common to the Roman period. What you see here is the same <laughs> vessel made out of wood. Okay, so this is a wooden bottle. Now, these things existed. People used wood all the time for different things. Only we usually don't find it because it just don't, doesn't preserve. And Masada gives us a really rare opportunity to see this aspect of um, of the material culture of people that usually we know, we assume that it was there. We just don't know because we don't find. So here we do find. Um, and other things that we can find are different ropes, uh, strings, fabrics, hair, human hair, animal hair that's preserved in, in a very, very good way. And this is another thing that was found by Yadin and this is a comb. It's a special comb. What do you think it's for? For lice. Okay? Uh, lice, uh, it's not a modern problem, of course. Uh, I, I have three kids. Every day I get emails from one of the kindergartens, check for lice. Okay? So, uh, this is a comb. And uh, the, the, the habits regarding uh, personal grooming and sanitation in the classical world, and even before and after, of course, very well known. So when we think about the individual, not the king, not the palaces, not the frescoes, we can think about, you know, a mother uh, combing the hair of a child during the Great Revolt. But, you know, the Romans are coming, but the kid has lice. <laughs> so what do we do? We check for lice. Okay, that's just what we do. Never mind, I'm going to kill that kid later because the Romans are coming. I'm sorry for the tragic note. <laughs> and if we're talking about a tragic note, <laughs> This is one of the major finds uh, found by Yadin, and these are the lots. Now you already know the names of this. Anyone remember? Well, how do we call this type of artifact? Ostraca. An ostracon, pieces of pottery that were used to write on. And it includes series of names. Names that we can, some of them attribute to names of the rebels through the text of Josephus. And as Josephus describes the rebels in the site, drew a lot. Who will kill who after they've uh, after the, all the men already killed their wives and children when after the Romans breached the gates and the wall? So that happened in the last night of the basically the rebellion. The Romans retreated to their camps, knowing okay this is done basically in the morning. So the rebels needed to make a decision what's going to happen. So the decision they made uh, was that the men each of the men will kill their families. And then they drew a lot, who will kill who? So that's a funny lottery. Uh, and Yadin found these lots. Now, of course, saying Yadin found these lots is a, a, a very big assumption, okay? Because they, it could also be receipts for distribution of bread that we also have. By the way, they look extremely similar. They can be many things. But you also need to remember the historical uh, environment that Yadin lived in and all the background of his research in order to really find these things. So, we are also here to re-examine this. We're in a different place, uh, nationally and culturally, today. Another thing, and we're drawing to an end here, another thing that, was, uh, that we're doing in our renewed excavation project is mapping the road system around Masada. We know some of the roads from the text, and we know them because they're still used today, like the snake path that goes up the mountain, and it's an ancient path. It's not exactly in the same route, but it existed there at the time. But surprisingly enough, no one ever bothered to survey all the ancient paths leading to Masada throughout the period, from the Hasmonean period and until the Byzantine period. And these paths, it's not just you know a beaten track in the ground. There are, there are uh, uh, streams and there are crevices and things that need to be bridged or, or covered over in order to allow the path to go smoothly. And we can find and date these activities. So one of the things we're doing is a GIS uh, survey, if you will, going with GPSs and, uh, and drones 
and creating a very uh, a thorough map of the paths leading to Masada, also of the Roman siege system, which I'm not going to get into now, and uh, creating 3D models of it and a lot of things that we hope that will be beneficial for future research at the site. And about what we are, of course, this is uh, us, and the center here is uh, very gracious to host us for mo one month of the year, which we create a terrible mess uh, because archaeology is dirty. And what we do here, we bring all of our material here, and here you can see the pottery and shirts and different finds that we collect on the mountain, we bring it all down, and here we process it, okay? We each, of course, get a number, and here we wash it, and read through it, and catalog it, and uh, this is all done here on the second floor of this center. But digging isn't only hard work, it is hard work, <laughs> of course, but um, we also take our volunteers, we have volunteers, we have students from Tel Aviv University. We take them on uh, um, guided tours and by the, this is Guy Stieber right here. I have a feeling he's photoshopped into this picture, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, so this is Guy Stieber and um, you, you can't find a better guide to the Roman sites in the vicinity of Masada anywhere, I think, in the world. And he takes them to Engedi and to Qumran and to tour the museum that he was part of creating uh, right here in Masada. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And I'm finishing with this picture because as archaeologists we always have to remember that we're, uh, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, in this picture you can see uh, Ig Igal Yadin, who is basically one of the founding fathers of the Institute of Archaeology in the Hebrew University. This is Yohanan Aaroni. Yohanan Aaroni was his colleague and rival, basically, who founded the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University. This is Moshe Kochavi, um, who is kind of like a, a, another a generation of a great archaeologist. And this is Moshe Dotan, another great archaeologist. So Masada was really a field school for, for an entire generation of Israeli archaeologists. And uh, he really created the picture. <laughs> Last season, we all we all grew mustaches. It's best to our abil genetic abilities. But uh, and we created a historical picture. This is our team, and uh, yeah, so we have a lot of fun. And I'm gonna finish in this note. Um, excavating Masada. Uh, a lot of people ask us. What is there left to find in Masada? So now, after two seasons, I can tell you a lot. Okay, we're actually mapping all the unexcavated parts from Yadin, and it's enough to last more than a decade of excavations. And I believe that with the tools that we that we have, we can achieve more information and new understanding. Sometimes even, um, you know telling our, our predecessors that they were wrong. And there's nothing wrong with it. They did the best they could with the tools and understanding that they had uh, at their time and were definitely based on their efforts. Um, but the principal rule in archaeology is always leave something for the future. And although we are planning a decade of excavations, we will definitely leave something for the future, for future archaeologists, because as we are now going and very happy that Yadin left us something to excavate because we can do new things, I'm sure in 50 years they're going to say, oh, look what these idiots from Tel Aviv did. We can do this so much better. Okay? And they probably will be right. So it's very important for us to really plan our excavation as well, to get the answers to our research questions, and no more, because there will be new ones. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, architects like reconstruction. Yeah. 
So is there any reconstructions that are, I, I would just like to know if there are reconstructions that meant that what the assessment of the might have been in those times? First of all, if you turn the site, you see that there are many. First of all, the site is reconstructed. They lifted the walls from what they found. You saw the black lines on the walls? This is the reconstruction line. Actually, Yadin invented it. It's called the Yadin line. It's a snake line, OK? Above that line, up to that line, it's what they found in excavation. Above that line is what they built anew, OK? But as you saw, they didn't try to build the arches and the domes and all the frescoes. If you went to Knossos in Crete, you see how a reconstruction, archaeological reconstruction, can very easily become sort of like an archaeological Disney World, OK? It's based on very, very slim evidence. I'm not saying it, uh, Arthur I, I Evans was wrong. I about actual reconstruction on site and then um, virtual. This, or so exactly, the, and, and I was leading yeah. to that. Yeah. Now, yeah, thankfully, we're living in, in an age that we can very easily create digital and virtual reconstructions of site, and the, the great value of that is that they're easily changed. Once you build in stone, it's very hard to change once you, you change your mind, or someone came with a better assumption. A digital reconstruction, and that's where the field is going definitely, is, is, so is, is the next level. It will be a part of our, of our plans, and uh, not, not only in Masada, in many, many other sites in the country and, and worldwide. Uh, there's also already virtual reconstruction of Giza, for example, in Egypt, virtual reconstructions of, of Petra in Jordan. And here in Israel, we're also working full steam on some of that. Yes, and more question? Yes. Right, let's see. Well, tombs, the graveyards, uh, uh, or things like that, you know? So, and, and the garbage dump? Okay, it's actually a very good question. Masada is infamous for its lack of burial. Why infamous for its lack of burial? We're talking about 960 people who committed suicide on the mountain. Historically, okay? We don't know if it's 960 or whatever. People who were here, I assume, weren't all enslaved, even if you see it's completely exaggerated. Where are their bodies? Nobody ever found their skeletons. And I can tell you honestly that you remember that cistern in Area B that I described? Like our little fantasy with the scrolls in Area D, we kind of fantasize that we might find skeletons in the cistern. And why? Because we know from other sites that were conquered by the Romans that they used the cisterns, which are very convenient already underground features, to dump the bodies of the defeated a garrison uh, in them and cover it up. It served two purposes. One, it's easily pla it's an easy place to dispose of bodies because you don't need to dig anything. It's just available. And second, by doing so, you're also kind of canceling the water installations uh, because they will be either contaminated or completely covered. So it was a Roman practice, very common. We see it in the Midras, we see it in other, in other sites in the country, that we find mass graves inside of cisterns. So we hope that we will find it here as well. But so but far, it was not for a very long time. Yeah. What did they do with the bodies? <laughs> I wish I could answer that question. Okay. I, I can. Now, about garbage pits, Yadin found a garbage pit, a very large one, mm -hmm. from the Herodian period. We know it's through the, the date of the pottery and everything. Uh, we haven't found yet another garbage pit, but I'm sure they're out there on the mountain. It's a big mountain, by the way. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> By the way, I'll just add, if any of you are interested to volunteer to come, look for us online, Masada Exhibition. Wow, okay, and nice. you can join in. We're planning already our 2009. But I think I think that there is okay. On one hand, there is a research, yeah. and then there is also the the, the the ability of of transmitting your knowledge to people who are not yes. and you're doing that in a absolutely fantastic way. Yeah. Because it. It, it was really you know better than a movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. So we have, uh, we're going to do a short uh, 
lecture. And we have Alessandro. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Martin, when. Uh, yeah, but if you, uh, many months you asked me for a lecture series. <laughs> and I said, lecture series. The question is that I really would like to have uh, Alessandra doing uh, her, her talk, her lecture. But I've checked. NGD is closing, like we have to enter in NGD at 3 o'clock maximum. No, 3 o'clock. It's closing at 4, but the entrance to NGD is not yet. Yeah. Three. But um, I think that we cannot do NGD and Maxada. Because Maxada is also closing, but Alexandra has to see Maxada. So uh, we might go to Maxada if you guys because it's not possible to do both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in tomorrow morning, you, you, know, you already went to fight Mansada. Um, okay, I have so different schedules. The, the, the thing that happens is that anyway, it's 3 o'clock. Or like uh, so 2 30, you have to leave, skip lunch again. <laughs> so, do we want to speak for 15 minutes and then uh, Alessandro will give her lecture? Alessandro is doing the, is, is doing the, the, uh, the, the keynote for the end, the closing. The closing. Yeah. Yeah. So, hopefully, finish before. I can stay. I need to talk to that guy. I mean, you can get it. No, no, no. No, we did we, 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 um, it. The question is that party. Well, yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead. What? No, that's okay. I'm going to have to go ahead. Something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the holy grail of archaeologists is the holy grail. But the Holy Grail with the writings on it is the, the top of the pot. And uh, that's what they're searching in Masada and all over the place. And uh, the major reference are all Josephus, all the scrolls from Kumilan. I'm going to talk about, let's see here, but uh, um, it's not a Hebrew lesson. It's uh, viewing, introspecting the Hebrew mechanism as an information transferring system at crossing time, as a tool. I'm going to talk about uh, textual archaeology, uh, which is a very, very useful tool that everybody can, uh, can try uh, without big laboratories, etc. So, I'm going to explore and demonstrate the phenomenon unique to Semitic languages and to Hebrew in particular. A careful research of which can tell us a lot about ourselves. A targeted use of the, of the phenomenon can even contribute to solving open questions in the region study, like the one related to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the polemic around the identity of the authors. What they just was said that uh, the people of Kumeran were such and such is in the very uh, 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 giant polemic for the last 20 years. Who were the, the people of Kumeran? Were the Essenes, uh, some uh, marginal sect that is uh, writing scrolls and uh, uh, not marrying uh, women? Or were they uh, um, uh, related? to the Kohanim, to the priests of the, of the Second Temple. Uh, there, are, there are also another, uh, you mentioned uh, Herods in contact to Essenes because of uh, uh, Building 13 in Masada that they found. There is a note in uh, Marcus, Mark the Evangelist, that relates to the Essenes as the Herodians. One short note that didn't repeat anywhere else in Mark, Marcus, that uh, relates to the Essenes as the Herodians. 
and the behavior thing also related to this phrase. <clears throat> so, uh, it's, why it is important, we will get to it. Um, I begin with an elementary demonstration of the phenomenon for, for you, that when you are not talking Hebrew, and also for people here <coughs> that speak Hebrew, and are not uh, trained in this uh, perception. <coughs> we will take a sequence of some frequently used words in English, but for a change we run them in the Google Images search engine which is not so bad empirical statistical examination that offers the most popular visual connected to applied search. If we examine the graphic imagery of those words in Google in its image engine, we will get this. If we search for moral, we will get, this is the most popular, one of the three or four first search that appears in Google image search. This is moral. This is tradition, devotion, delivery, and also SMS, and appears to be no ear-catching phonetic resemblance, no visual similarity. Again, the visual does not raise semantic affinity between the words. The visual, if, if I give you only the visuals, you will not think that they are connected in a way, only if you are well trained in uh, thinking about religions, etc. Now we will translate the same sequence of words we searched earlier directly to Hebrew. What do we get? Moral is Musar. Tradition is Masora. Devotion is Mesiru. Delivery is Mesira. SMS is Misron. Misron is a new one. You know, it's a new word, only in, I believe 10, 20 years in Hebrew. But still, it's connected. Uh, Visually speaking, the imagery search shows close resemblance with minor alterations. But the phonetic similarity immediately becomes apparent, even more so heard, as we see something else. You see, I, I, I uh, 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 alter the color of the, the, the sequence that appears in all of them. A repeated sequence of consonant MSR implanted deep within the heart of each of those words, and in fact creating an impressive context, an uh, interpretive context. Either be known to the user, or more often in case is not be known to the user, the context. When searching Google Images for this core sequence, MSR in Hebrew, these two words are the first results. Somebody is transferring an idea to somebody else's ears, and message in the bottle. So what can we say? so far from comparative observation of this phenomenon. Again, I'm not talking about Hebrew in particular, I'm talking about information transfer system called Hebrew. So we have a set of different signifiers that separately do, separately do not relate to the same signifier. The signifiers because they become a group because of a similar sequence appearing in all of them, causing phonetic resemblance. And also, we heard biologists before, uh, if we use an allegory from the most common information system in nature, the genome, uh, it's actually it's a DNA lookalike system. You know the, the gene, every, uh, in the DNA, a fixed sequence of three bases is in a certain order and codes a certain amino acid. If that sequence is altered, the amino acid changes. And if amino acid changes, a segment of life is changing. Uh, so we see, you know, if we take uh, UAG, it gives us a specific amino acid. A different sequence will give another amino acid. The sequence MSR functions as sort of a metadata file for the entire group of words. Uh, thus, a semantic commune, a field of meaning is created in which different words are floating and the speaker identifies that in a way they are connected. We are all familiar with hashtag, we are all hashtagging. You are playing in the internet and you are tagging something and it takes you what is hashtag, some short string that takes you to a whole world connected in between. 
So that's how the info works. This is how this joint sequence works. It is a hashtag of semantic commune. Perhaps a burning of a neural network in our brain occurs in the same manner. This means <coughs> that a time traveler from the Dead Sea of 2000 years ago could heal the world, modern world SMS today. Or in Hebrew Mishon. And he would be and realize it must have something to do with the delivery of small message. He heard me song, he never saw a smartphone in his life, but he knows that it's going because he knows Musa and Masoret and Masirot, he already knows. And me song, he, he would know it, some, something to do, with, to do with it. The bigger the semantic commune is, the greater the amount of words in that meaning field carrying the same sequence, the better our relative understanding of each of the words in the commune. The phenomenon greatly undermines the hermeneutic barrier. You know, the hermeneutic barrier, how, what did the ancient speaker really mean with certain expression in that time? And if confronting Jacques Derrida, you know, the, the difference, this phenomenon significantly, significantly reduces his famous difference. They interpret it inherent dilemma. <coughs> so we have a semantic commune. Here, by this phenomenon. We'll go to another, um, observe another quality of the phenomenon by demonstrating a different sequence of semantic commune. Once again, we go to Google uh, search engine and we take this uh, streak of words in English trash, statue, disqualified, chisel, if severed. In Hebrew, psolet, tesel, pasul, we've said it. What is the connection? What is the assimilation because of this, of, of this closeness in uh, phonetic resemblance? Here, among the conclusion of the last example of Musa Masoud, we find an additional beauty assimilation of theological value using the other words in semantic common and the phonetic resemblance. As is well known, <clears throat> the first monotheist and warrior against idolatry, Abraham, um, is absent in, in archaeology. We have no archaeology for Abraham or Isaac. <clears throat> but here we see a testimony within the language in that, to that very notion manifested in the second commandment. the second commandment, you should make no idols. How? The word statue, pestle, and disqualified, pasul, are linked phonetic, phonetically. Solid, and pestle, statue, and pasul, disqualified. Phonetic resemblance. We can learn more when we observe the time in which signifiers words join the semantic commune. The word trash, solid, and disqualified pasul join the commune only during the Hellenistic occupation of the region around 180 BC and are quite common in the Mishnah and the Talmud era. I, we have another tool, we have a, a dating tool, timing. We know, you know, like C14, <coughs> when the specific word join the commune, we can uh, 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 know uh, about specific event. This means that we get an additional multifunctional tool. A tool for elegant assimilation of moral values, <clears throat> and a tool for analyzing the zeitgeist of a given era. Why the zeitgeist? <clears throat> because the link between statue and trash and disqualified came only uh, during the Hellenistic era, with the big, you know, uh, rebellion against uh, uh, putting uh, idolatry in the temple. And <clears throat> it's a tool for comparative archaeology uh, of text finding in Hebrew. So with these assumptions and this set of tools, we will try and dare confront the polemic in the research of the Dead Sea Scrolls. As known, research are, researchers are conflicted over the question of scroll authors, as we said before. 
where the separatist marginal sect of what we call Essenes that sustains extraordinary literacy alongside extremist concept of the end of the days, purity, and the apocalyptic war, or perhaps the scrolls altar were none other than the sons of Tzadok. Um, a family of priests, Kohanim, descended from Tzadok, the first high priest in Solomon's temple. This method proceeds to claim that the priests of Hal Tzadok took off the dead to the desert with the library of the second temple. Actually, what we found in Kumeran caves, the, the, the Kumeran call scrolls, some serious research scholars are claiming that this is the library of the second temple. It's not some marginal sect that are writing, you know, uh, uh, eschatology uh, about the end of the days, etc. Um, during the appearance of the heresy crew in the area of the second century BC, in that library, which is in fact the collection of scrolls found in clay vases in Qumran to the north of the Dead Sea, live together both <coughs> the familiar text, as we know today as the Old Testament, and additional theological text cut out and politically ignored with the creation of the rabbinical Judaism after the destruction of the Second Temple. This question is a loaded one. It's not just a question who wrote the scrolls. Heavily loaded even, and fundamental towards everything we know about the time of the creation of Judaism and Christianity as well. The circumstances, circumstances, that, circumstances that brought to the ideological separation. I'm talking about 200 years BC. I'm talking about way before Christ came to, to, to this world. The transition from a prolonged period of central worship and animal sacrifice in one place at the hand of privileged few to the time of literacy, scholarship, for every individual and much, much more. Let's open our toolbox again. We'll go to this toolbox again. The time, this time, we'll take the sequence, this sequence, demand, preacher, school required. You see the, in Hebrew, the resemblance of the semantic coming. In English, in Hebrew, is midrosh, darsham, midrash, darush. Phonetic resemblance, immediate phonetic, phonetic resemblance. This is what Google Images present for the sequence DRS, H. Okay. This is the most to the top uh, search, a book of Midrash. Now the expression Midrash in Hebrew, Midrash, appears in tens of occurrences in the Bible, all of which in a sense of demanding something that is lacking, or demanding answer from God. Midrash in the Pentateuch, in the five... Uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, it always appears in, uh, in, in, in a sense of demanding something from God. Moses turned to God with, Ki midrash Elohim. They will come to me to demand God. The word Midrash, on the other hand, is one of the classic signifiers of the transition from Judaism <coughs> with central priestly worship. I'm talking central priestly worship, I'm talking about the, the, the temple, the, the animal sacrifice, etc. To what Judaism that privatized the holiness into the language. Judaism that privatized the holiness into the language. From hierarchical society towards <clears throat> enlightened Judaism, where communal learning is the sacred way to demand God. How, how do you demand God? Not by sacrificing animal, by learning, by talking by praying, by talking with uh, a friend, what we call in Hebrew, Chavruta. Instead of ritual of uh, animal sacrifice and uh, the Moor and Levana and all this uh, Monty Python full of uh, uh, scenes. Well, the word Midrash in that sense appears 15 times in the Mishnah and hundreds of times more in the Talmud and the superseding theological literature. But if we go further back 200 years to the approximate time of the writing of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we discover, <clears throat> to be discovered 
the first step is called to be discovered was the, com the community room, Serech HaYachad, in cave number one, in Kumeran. In this very it is very surprising to see how often Drash appears in the sense of communal learning and discussion of the Holy Script. Even one occurrence of the word Midrash in the sense we only saw 200 years later. Again, we saw it in Qumran, in the north of the Red Sea, as this sequence Midrash in the same meaning that only 200 years appears. No more Midrash God, but rather Midrash Torah. We are not demanding something uh, in the vertical axis, we are demanding in the horizontal axis. We are uh, talking, we are, uh, 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 we are demanding text. No more searching for God in the traditional places that in true traditional mediators, but true language and common learning. And then, here in Russia Torah. This is the community world page five, column five. In Russia Torah. And it's not there. And then an interesting light is shed on, on the understanding of the great polemic in the scroll research I've mentioned earlier. That perhaps a group, the group residing in the north of the Dead Sea, and wrote these words that we can easily read today with no dictionary, perhaps planted the seeds of the Pharisees revolution itself. I am saying Pharisees, it's the early Judaism. It's the early rabbinical Judaism. Perhaps the rabbinical Judaism started in the Dead Sea after all. <clears throat> the revolution that renounced worship of animal sacrifice in the temple and privatized the holiness into the language with the Latin, with the claim, holiness for all. The revolution that neutralized the privileged status of one priestly lineage. Let's see it afterwards. One priestly lineage and in fact gradually created an equal and lighter group in which one's social status doesn't matter, but rather one's dedication in studying Midrash and specifically demanding enlightenment. Finally, in more daring words, one might claim that after a thousand years in which the ruling mindset was of Aharon, the high priest, here in the Dead Sea, the language cosmology and social consciousness of Moses has returned to its former greatness. <coughs> and now, we the uh, last two fast uh, uh, slide will uh, I will relate to architecture with this set of tools because we are architects. Now in the Bible, in the, in the Pentateuch, we do not find Mikdash or any uh, architectural uh, uh, instructions to build Mikdash, the Solomon Temple. We have no instructions to build Solomon's Temple or Herod's Temple. Solomon's Temple was first and then uh, people that uh, came back from Babylon exile and then Herod, he was a third. We have no instructions to temple, we have instruction for this, for a tent. Uh, what, which is called by Moses Ohel Moed, the tent of time. Uh, or, in another word in Hebrew, Mishkan, tabernacle. And now let's go for, in this world with the same uh, mechanism. We have tabernacle, divine spirit, housing, neighbor. In Hebrew, Mishkan, Shechina, Shikun, Shachem. You see the phonetic resemblance, and you see what I before tried to give you the sense of. <coughs> the horizontal concept, perception of life, the social perception of life. Mishkan is not something poor. It's something in, 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 in the attempt, in your height, and also Shachem, neighbor, and also Shechina. Shechina is more mystical world, divine spirit. Uh, in Kabbalistic uh, 
claims uh, Shekhinah is the feminine uh, uh, manifestation of God. Uh, but it's something that is existing here. It, it's not something uh, uh, that we have to bring down from the sky. Housing, shikun, shikun in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, is some uh, commoner uh, living together. And this is the word, this is uh, Moses' cosmology. Mishkan, uh, Shekhinah, tabernacle, neighbor, <coughs> society. We go to uh, the Mikdash, the temple time, and by the way, in Kumeran, we found the only architectural set of orders how to build Mikdash temple, which is the, the Mikdash scroll. And it's uh, more than 90% uh, leads to the, the, the real uh, architecture of Herod's temple and Solomon's. So in, 11, uh, uh, in the 11th quay, uh, cave in Qumran, they found this temple scroll with these specific uh, instructions how to build it, architectural instructions. Now in Mikdash, what do you see? We have temple, holy, consecrated, binding bow. See the words in Hebrew. And uh, for the Hebrew speaking people here, the two left, it is not part of the Hebrew Academy uh, to Hebrew language. Uh, this um, uh, manifestation of semantic common. In Hebrew we see Mikdash, Kadosh, Mekudash. Now two words that are neighboring words. Akeda, the binding of Isaac's, Isaac's binding by Abraham. And bow, Kida, when you bow. The, on the vertical le uh, level. And holy also, it's vertical. Uh, it, I, I'm talking about uh, Google image uh, searching. You, something that you got coming from above. And the temple. You see, the temple was a giant, not connected in no world to Moses' instruction how to build the Mishkan Zas. Okay. And, and uh, <coughs> you see, here in the Dead Sea, in Qumran caves, these two cosmologies are founding. By the way, the writings of this scroll of Mikdash, the temple scroll in Qumran, was different from all other scrolls. It shows, it, it looks like this scroll was taken uh, as, a, was imported to this, uh, to, to the time capsule bag that they kept there. It was, it was not from the day-to-day -day, uh, um, debate or, or how they live. So, uh, these two cosmologies are, uh, I believe, in the heart of society research today, uh, of all humanities research, of uh, um, uh, Education, if you are confronting, confronting, and, and, and giving, uh, okay, so that's what I had to say about Hebrew, about this phenomenon in Hebrew that actually gives us a nice box of tools to do some text archaeology backwards. And to be, and afterwards we can validate it with plastic findings from, from the Matzado. So thank you. 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 Yes. And I remember last year in our discussion that you were presenting this as some kind of a vision or so to what you would like to do here at the research center. So uh, I really want to thank you for this because I think it's very important. You know, I know that there is the academic world and that there is a need that you also think about, you know, to think ahead about the way we can have the different disciplines interacting. Yeah. So,
it's quite a tough one, you know, to, uh, this interdisciplinary uh, classes, but you must work them. Because, you know, uh, research, academic research, is a uh, mission of human beings. This is one kind of process. So, so, so thank you very much. Thank you. I think that we won't have time for more because we no have problem. to. Uh, uh, Alessandra lecture will be for later because the thing that happens is that the, the you know I think that uh, not less important is also for the students to be able to experience the Dead Sea and the area and I know that they want to go out and develop you know and, and pursue and lead the, the, the research center with this kind of message that we just gave. And so that we can have them going maybe to Qumran or to El and uh, pursue pursue the, the day uh, over there. Um, Quran, I, I would not prefer to Qumran. But to El Gedi, probably. El yes. Okay. Or, or go back to Masada. But, but what I would like to do is that. Um, and just so. And, and you're still here, it's great. Aaron, Aaron yeah. can I say, uh, sure. I'm really apologize for this. No, 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 don't worry. Fine, we can tomorrow or another day. No, well, what I was thinking is maybe when Aaron comes back in Jerusalem. No, so, uh, we will discuss that maybe tomorrow and next time we'll organize something. Yeah, when you come back in Jerusalem and then the hotel on the room. But then I have to record your lecture for David. Yes. Because we will do that, David, so that we can have that kind of exchange that we've been talking about. No, guys, we have the internet today. Yeah, and we, and, and we, we are really, we are really, uh, one of the plans of the Institute is to build here a virtual center, a center for, uh, 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 no, virtual reality and yeah. augmented reality here in this uh, lobby. So, so we'll have a lot to talk about. Not only for fun, but for research, yeah, you know, okay. to see microbiome and to see Masada, you know. But, but uh, uh, David, I really would like to thank you. This is the second year that we are coming to you. And we hope this is going to turn into some kind of a tradition. Uh, OK? So uh, thank you very much for hosting us today. And for all the amazing lectures that you have organized together with Tom. Thank you so, so much. And Alessandra, uh, this is uh, just get ready because your turn is coming. It's it's going to happen. Did you like it or not? I'm tender ready. Absolutely. And David, we share all this with you. Thank you so much. What's up, David? It was all televised. Yeah, it's live in YouTube. Oh, that's what we've been showing. You know that you were live on YouTube. Yeah. Actually, I want to thank the researchers for coming and yeah, thank you very much. 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 Yeah, one of the guys wants to use the USB. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Do you know who it was? Uh, uh, yeah, I do know. Okay, so I've got it, but I don't know how he's going to do it right now. Well, that's the thing. It's uh, not a very late. I want to show that. Well, he wants yeah, to do it. Sure. Oh, I didn't show it. Yeah. No, but he said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it was in the third, but one guy was asking me to use my What? Wait, are you guys going back to the hotel? No. No. No, you're staying? Uh, no, we're going. Oh, you're leaving. Yeah, Timona? Oh, no, no. Uh, where are you? Um, there's Timna and there's Namchi. Ah, uh, Namchi. And then Elan? Well, and then Elan. Okay. I'll tell you, great. Well, it's time. No, I don't know if you talk to the guy more. I don't really know what's going on. Maybe okay. You can, you can okay, okay. Thank you.